right, here we go. So good evening, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. Welcome to Sundays at 7, which is a weekly broadcast that we endeavor to have every single week, a wisdom inspiration series, which is powered by Chabad of West Mount Urban Retail Lectures. And this forum strives to share wisdom and inspiration on timely issues relevant to Judaism, life, and society. For those of you who are tuning in for the first time, my name is Devorah Shanowitz, and I'm honored to be part of the incredible team at Chabad of West Mount. Today, we bring you a special program. This Friday, 17th of Av in the Jewish calendar, August 7th, 2020, the Jewish world lost a great light. Extraordinary scholar, prolific writer, unparalleled teacher of Torah, Talmud, Mishnah, and Jewish mysticism, Rabbi Adin Evan Yisrael Steinzaltz returned his holy soul to his maker in the holy city of Jerusalem. The world is bereft of one of the most prolific scholars and teachers of all time. Israeli President Ruben Rivlin, who studied regularly with Rabbi Steinzaltz, as well as Jonathan Sachs, who was a former chief rabbi of Great Britain and a great scholar in his own right, said of Rabbi Steinzaltz, they both said of Rabbi Steinzaltz that he was the Rashi of this generation. Rashi, as you all know, is the foremost commentator on the Torah. As well, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said that Torah, he remembered Shane Zeltz as a Torah genius and a man of exemplary spirit. His important work, said Netanyahu, will stand for generations at the foundation of Jewish heritage as an eternal flame. His genius was recognized way beyond the Jewish world Years ago, Time Magazine hailed him as a once in a millennium scholar, and his teachings were studied the world over, actually even in China. At once humble, witty, brilliant, and approachable, Rabbi Steinzeltz revolutionized the accessibility of Torah study. He took the sublime, the esoteric, the plain, and the allegorical, and brought it to life for both layman and scholar. He devoted his life to unraveling the depths of Torah and to make it accessible for all. He wrote more than 60 books and hundreds of articles on Torah, but the masterwork that he is best known for is his astonishing massive translation and commentary of the entire Babylonian Talmud, which he worked on for 45 years completing the 44 volume Hebrew edition in 2010. We were blessed as a community to have Rabbi Steinzeltz visit us at Chabana West Mount three times. In his last visit, he sat down for a conversation with Mr. Murray Dolphin on Judaism, life, love, the Rebbe. He even chimed in on Canadian versus American. Today, we bring you excerpts of this extraordinary conversation via Zoom. But I ask you to bear with us because the technology of Zoom does not allow for the highest resolution of, of streaming. And Rabbi Steinzeltz's voice is somewhat um, weak or lowered in the video. But nevertheless, there are great moments that we're going to share with you today. As well, before we begin with the, sharing the video of his visit here at, in Montreal at Chabad of West Mount, we want to share with you a glimpse into Rabbi Adin Steinzaltz, the man, from the people who knew him, from his supporters. Today, I interviewed several people who were his family, who are his family members rather, and they shared anecdotes of close family encounters and different parts of his personality that most people may not know about. However, they could not join us on Zoom, but we will share some of their anecdotes as well. But with us tonight, we, we are very honored to have Mr. Murray, Murray Dolphin, who together with his wife, Karen Dolphin, are devoted friends and supporters of Rabbi Adin Steinzaltz and his work for many, many years. As many of you know, Murray Dolphin is a, 
a noted philanthropist on, on a high level. Uh, most notably, for our, from, from my perspective, I know him as the philanthropist, one of the great supporters and builders of Chabad of West Mount, but he's far more known than that. He's a, a noted Canadian philanthropist who has really built a, 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 an empire in, in real estate um, and has a, a shame tov in the business community. And he is a, a tremendous supporter of Israel, the state of Israel, Technion, Israel Bonds, Jewish General Hospital, you name it. A, an organization that is worthy um, and, and humanitarian and Jewish, and you will find Murray's support there. So we're extremely honored to have with us Rabbi, uh, rather, we're extremely honored to have with us Mr. Murray Dolphin, who joins us tonight, and he will share with us some, some of his thoughts. And I'm just going to begin by asking uh, Menachem, Mr. Dolphin, if you can share with us, how did you meet uh, Rabbi Steinzeltz? Uh, I first met, oh, hi, Bora. <laughs> nice to see you and Yossi, in, almost in person. Um, I first met Rabbi uh, Steinsaltz actually through his work. Uh, I, uh, I've always had a keen interest in Kabbalah, and uh, I found this book called The Thirteen Petal Rose, and how remarkable that little slim volume was. It talks about uh, worlds above worlds, each influencing uh, each other, uh, every action having an impact on the highest worlds and uh, angels created from thoughts, your own thoughts. And it was really uh, an, an amazing work. And I decided that I had to, uh, I had to meet with him uh, personally. And so I was able to arrange a personal meeting uh, with, uh, with his secretary, um, uh, Margie Ruth Davis. And as a matter of fact, I just spoke to her uh, today. Um, and um, Devorah, are you still there? I'm just seeing your picture. Oh yes, uh, sorry for that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> sorry for that. Uh, I pressed something else and <laughs> this happens okay. to me in Zoom. Like <clears throat> pressing one thing and something else comes off. You just gotta kind of bear with it when I guess with these things. Okay. Uh, so I had an opportunity to meet with him. Uh, in Israel, actually, and uh, and we became um, dear friends. Uh, I, I find it unbelievable that I was able to know him for so many years, maybe uh, 25 or 30 years, mm. um, on a very uh, close personal level. Uh, he was uh, humble in one respect. He was approachable, shall we say, but not humble. Uh, and he had strong opinions about things, and he was uh, prepared to express them. And there were certain things that were uh, uh, very precious to him. One of them was smoking his pipe. <laughs> and it didn't really matter where or when. He was, except on Shabbat, of course, he was going to smoke his pipe. So one uh, time when uh, he was at our home, uh, my wife Karen came into the room, <laughs> what was he doing? smoking his pipe. The whole house was filled with pipe smoke. <laughs> I went for a walk with him. He was smoking his pipe in my own car with the windows closed, smoking his pipe. Uh, had a wonderful experience. Uh, the, um, one of the times I was supposed to meet with him was in, uh, in Yerushalayim at, at uh, a school that he has uh, uh, for uh, its primary school actually. And I couldn't find him. There were hundreds of kids there, and I just could not find him. But I smelled the smoke, and I was <laughs> able to follow him to find him uh, in his office. Anyway, he was uh, quite a remarkable person. I'm very saddened by, uh, by his loss. Um, what projects were you involved? I know you were involved with many projects um, in, in helping him publish some of his works. Which projects were you involved with, and can you can you discuss uh, some of the projects that uh, sure. you're involved with? Yeah. So, so we uh, we were involved in uh, in uh, sponsoring uh, several books, including the Thirteen Petaled Rose, uh, the Long Shorter Way, which was uh, 
a layman's guide to Tanya uh, that you could understand. Um, uh, quite a remarkable work, a sustaining utterance, and a very powerful book that he wrote called My Rebbe, um, about the Lubavitcher Rebbe, about his personal experiences, and about uh, what impact the Rebbe had on, on Jewish life. Uh, so, uh, very important things. I, I remember when he came to Montreal, part of, part of the reason that he came, obviously, was to fundraise for his important projects, and you organized a fundraiser for him. Which project was that for? Was that the, uh, was the, 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 the last time he came in, in, to Montreal? Which project was, was that? It was, it was for one volume of Talmud. Mm. So um, several people uh, uh, came uh, to our home for, uh, for lunch uh, with, with Rabbi uh, Steinsaltz. And uh, each person uh, contributed a certain amount of money, and we were able uh, to raise enough uh, to sponsor one volume of Talmud. And uh, we also had the opportunity, then we went uh, directly to Chabad of Westmount, uh, where we met privately uh, with him. Uh, and, uh, and then, of course, uh, we had our, uh, one of the talks uh, that he gave at uh, Chabad of Westmount, and were very meaningful. Yes, indeed. I, that was a big privilege and a highlight uh, that I will always remember. Today, I had the privilege of speaking to uh, his sister-in-law, um, Sharon Janowitz, who is actually also my sister-in-law. And I uh, interviewed her on different aspects of his life that I wanted, I wanted her to be able to share today. But for whatever reason, she won't be able to come on in person. But she shared that when she was at their home, she never, she would stay, when she would come visit, she would stay in their home in Jerusalem. She said he never ever went to bed before three or four in the morning. He was working till then. And that her sister, his wife, would wait up for him so that she could prepare something for him to eat before he, before he would leave, uh, before he would go to bed, rather. And he would nevertheless would wake up in the morning. He, he worked so much. What do you think drove him? Well, what, he... Uh, he had this desire to bring Judaism and the most esoteric work in Judaism uh, available to everyone. Without having to be a Talmud Chacham, you were able to uh, pick up one of his uh, texts on, on Kabbalah or Tanya or Chumash and understand. Um, as a matter of fact, my Shabbat companion these days is the Steinsaltz uh, humash, where you can read through it, essentially without commentary, uh, mm. because he inserts his own commentary uh, mm. into every single passage, a distinguishing, of course, between uh, the, the literal and, and his, uh, his commentary. But that was a special talent he had to bring things down to a level that, that regular people could really understand and, and, uh, and appreciate. And how did he find the time to do all these projects? I, I you know, there's the, the, just the sheer volume of the one, to, to do one edition of the Talmud. He did, he finished the entire Talmud. And then in, in between that, he was writing a tremendous, just a tremendous amount of books. Like how did he, how, you were with him a lot. How did you see him organize his time? How did he manage that? Uh, the times that I spent with him, uh, did not include him writing <laughs> or doing his work. Uh, they were uh, more relaxation times. Mm -hmm. So walks in Westmount, uh, driving in the car, going to visit one potential uh, donor after another, uh, time in, in Jerusalem uh, together, which was extremely meaningful. Uh, those were the, the times, and I'll tell you some things. Uh, he used to daven at the Tzemach Tzedek uh, shul in Jerusalem, which is near the Kotel. Mm -hmm. And I knew exactly where he sat. So what I would do is when, when uh, I was in Jerusalem, is I would go there, and I knew what, what time he would come in, which was always late. And I would go in and sit opposite from the seat that I knew was reserved for him. Mm -hmm. And uh, without announcing myself, he would come in and uh, he had this most remarkable smile. Mm -hmm. And his memory was extraordinary. It was just extraordinary. There's nothing that he didn't remember. I have trouble remembering what I had for breakfast. <laughs> and he, 
he was he was just his memory was limitless. Hmm. I think he drew from that uh, to create much of of what he did, and uh, I had uh, some very very special meaningful times with him that I that I could tell you about. Sure, um, that would, that would be awesome. Uh, one, one time we were walking in uh, in Westmount uh, before actually uh, one of the Chabad uh, uh, lectures, and I went, uh, of course, wearing a kippa, and we walked around Westmount on Redfern Avenue and elsewhere, and uh, he said something really powerful to me. He said, you know, if one changes their direction by even one degree, they end up in a different destination, mm. which was, uh, I thought, very powerful. So I came home wearing a kippa. And uh, Cameron said to me, what's with the kippa? <laughs> <laughs> so that, that, one, that was my one degree, my wow. one degree change, wow. which was uh, important to me. He also said some, he also had ex extraordinary knowledge. One time I told him, he asked me what I drank. And at the time I was drinking vodka. And I said, I would never mix two, two kinds of drinks, uh, like vodka or whiskey. And he said, why not? I said, because my mother told me you never mix drinks. He said, well, your mother was wrong. You can mix two drinks. It's just alcohol. But he had this wealth of knowledge. It didn't, you know, science, math, uh, uh, physics, uh, and Torah, of course. You know, it was, it was, it was really quite something. What would you I, say? I had an opportunity. Sorry, Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Go no, ahead. I had an opportunity to... to uh, to visit with, uh, to together with him, visit the the Ohel, hmm. and he insisted on going quite late. And normally, uh, this was uh, one of the Rebbe's yurt sites. And normally, it would be a lineup, and it would be you know, you'd have to wait hours. But just being with him, of course, everything parted, <laughs> and we brought straight to the Ohel. So he was uh, he had some influence, shall we say, in the uh, Chabad community. Oh yes, well, obviously super respected, and he had a very close uh, relationship to the rabbi. I know that Rabbi Steinsaltz um, had, some, you know, many health challenges throughout his life from an early age, and uh, went underwent many, many surgeries and many, many medical procedures, uh, which rendered him very, very tired and weak. And nevertheless, he was he carried on. But uh, one one of the uh, one of the stories that I heard today from people that I was interviewing was that when he, he had one particular operation, which was very uh, serious, and that the Rebbe, the Rebbe had his office call the Hadassah Hospital, I think, every single day to get updates on his condition. So that was, you know, that was something that was very, very, uh, that was very concerning to the Rebbe, and the Rebbe was very worried about his health and obviously gave him also many, many blessings. But, but he never, you know, this person told me that he never took a break, and that even when he had a coffee in the morning, he always had a Gemara or some kind of uh, another book in his hand. He was always studying. Mm -hmm. uh, what was what was the uh, what would you say? Um, what would you say was the most unique trait that he had? I mean, he's obviously a, a composite of many unique traits. But what do you think was his m most unique trait? Well, aside from his brilliance and his ability to communicate so effectively to all levels of people. Um, he was not, um, he was not arrogant. Uh, he was very self-confident, but he was not arrogant. Mm. And I really only saw him lose his temper once. Mm. It was actually at that time when we had the lunch at our home, uh, just ahead of, uh, the Chabad of Westmount lecture. And somebody dared criticize a book that he wrote, uh, about the Talmud. Mm. And, um, he, he, he got very hot at that point. And uh, that person uh, got quiet very quickly. So, <laughs> but that was the only time I actually seen him lose his temper. He actually had a wonderful sense of humor, and he was very kind. Um, he he was also extraordinarily brave, and he dismissed his own physical failings. I remember one time when uh, he had fallen down on on a Shabbat walk uh, to to shul and broke his arm. Mm. And some, uh, some weeks later, I was in, in, uh, in the shul in, uh, in Yerushalayim, hoping but not expecting 
to see him. And he came in with a cast on. And I said to him, Rabbi, what's, why are you here? And he just <laughs> did that. <laughs> like it wasn't, wasn't important. Another interesting factor that I, I really enjoyed about him, I mean, at Chabad of Westmount, when we dove in, we, we are quiet. There's, there's not a whole lot of talking. People are serious about their davening. Rabbi Science Alts was not serious about the davening. Mm. And one of the things that actually disturbed me is that in shul, he would be busy talking to people. Anybody that would approach him, he would <laughs> interrupt his <laughs> prayers and he would talk to them. But I guess he spent so much time immersed in Torah that uh, he felt it was really important to reach out to people on every level. Uh, on, on a personal level as well. You know, I, I think that speaks to a certain kind of spiritual self-sacrifice that he had for others. You know, there's this concept that we have that we, we, that great people are called upon not only to sacrifice their material well-being for spirituality, which is a level in of itself, but also in, in, the, in the Hasidic books and in the, in the mystical books to sacrifice your spiritual well-being on behalf of someone else. So for example, there's a tradition in the mystical teachings that when you cut your fingernails, that you should burn them. And fingernails themselves are considered to be tame, so you dispose of them. But when you burn them, mystically speaking, it's not good for yourself. But nevertheless, that's what a person who is more elevated and, and caring for the, the welfare of another does. And I think that perhaps the reason why he would engage was because I think he put his, his, his spiritual welfare on the back burner for someone else's material well-being. In other words, if someone came in and someone needed to have that hello, he would do it. Today, I, I again, within an interview that I did, someone shared with me the story that he had gone to Eastern Europe on a trip and he was made aware that there was a burial plot of, a, of an ancestor that he could visit and that someone had located this burial plot, that he was really, really interesting, this, interested in seeing this burial plot of his ancestor. He wanted to go there and do some prayers. But at the same time, he had had the opportunity to reach out to some youth in Eastern Europe. And he was vacillating between reaching out to the youth, which would be something that he would do for others, or the spiritual opportunity that he would have to go pray at the gravesite of his ancestor, which was a grave that was just uncovered, just found. And he finally decided that the living take precedence and that the youth needed him. And so he didn't go, he forego, he forewent rather, that opportunity to pray at the gravesite of an ancestor, something that he really endeavored to do. And he put that as a side and instead went to, to reach out to the youth. And I think that speaks to what you were talking about, this idea of like my spiritual welfare, I could put on the back burner, but there's someone here who needs a hello, someone who needs a welcome. And I, I also found that quite interesting in, in, in my, in my uh, interactions with him, that the warmth um, and the simplicity that he kind of exuded, this, which I guess threw people off. They thought this big scholar is going to come, and here was this very simple, uh, you know, this simple per looking, so to speak, person. You know, I know that you, you, um, you, you aware of the the great uh, work that that he did. What do you think is his greatest writings or the most important writing? Or maybe there's a few. What is your favorite one? In in all the well, my, my my favorite one is the uh, Thirteen Petaled Rose, uh, which is just remarkable. So I encourage everybody that's listening uh, to take a copy and read it because it's very very powerful. And uh, it's, it's a short volume, but it's extremely meaningful. I would just like to share with you uh, mm. a couple of other a little anecdotes sure. uh, before our time is up uh, mm. that, uh, that I had with him. My, my, uh, my daughter, uh, mm. Jordana, uh, was giving birth. Uh, mm. She was supposed, she was around her due date. Mm. And it was just at the time that her grandmother, my wife's mother, was really on her last days. And uh, the, the question was, Jor lives in Chicago and she was going to be giving birth, what to do? So I called him and I said, what, what do we do in this situation? He said, choose life. Mm -hmm. And we did, we got on a plane uh, that night and we made it just in time uh, for the birth. 
Hmm. Hmm. But just missed saying goodbye uh, to grandma. Hmm. So we followed his advice. I had another very meaningful experience with him. We, uh, uh, this was after his stroke. He had a stroke and he was unable to speak. Continued to work, by the way, till the end, um, editing his work. Um, and did he, how his did he office, accomplish that? How did he, he accomplish that? He lost, his ability, he lost his ability to speak, but he retained his ability to think and to write, which was, I mean, you'd have to be a neurologist to understand that, but that's, that's what he did. And uh, I, I was in, uh, visiting uh, in, in, in shul with him um, when, uh, after, you know, about a year after his stroke. And he saw me and I, I got a big smile, which was very meaningful. And after shul at Kiddush, um, uh, around the table, everybody was asking for somebody who had experience with Rabbi Steinsaltz to, to describe an experience. And I talked about uh, an experience. Actually, I, I related the experience of the one degree uh, mm. and, and the impact it had on me. And uh, he passed me a chocolate. <laughs> and he couldn't speak, but he gave me something sweet. Mm, so I'll, I'll, I'll miss him. I'll miss him terribly. And, and you're saying that you, you start to wear a yarmulke from that time on and you've kept yes. it on. Wow, that, yes. that, is, that, is, that, is, that, is un, that is a beautiful story. You know, an, another story that I, I heard today also in the interviews that I was doing was that he had gone to Minnesota to speak to students, unbeknownst to him. The organizer had organized this event during and the finals of the, you know, the end, the end of the year finals. And no students were coming. They were cramming. They were not coming to hear some rabbi speak. And he had flown in straight from Israel to this event. And he was sorely disappointed to see that only a few students showed up. And he was also very, very upset. He berated the rabbi and he said, why, you know, why did you put me in a situation? I flew in straight from Israel to, to speak to this group of students. I expected to see a, a sizable number of students, you know, in this big university and, and like, you have a handful of students. And uh, well, that's what happened. And he spoke. 10 or 20 years later, he was at the Kotel. And he's standing and a young man comes over to him and he says to him, do you, do you recognize me? He says, no, I don't. Who are you? And he said, I was one of those few students that managed to come to that lecture. And what you said that night transformed my life. And I, here I am connecting back to my people. And he repeated the story, apparently, to anyone who was involved with reaching out to Jewish youth and saying, I was disappointed that there wasn't a big crowd, but you never know the power of the one act or the one thing that you say. And, and you know, that kind of idealism, you know, suffused him. And I, I, I just want to add something that another aspect of this very interesting personality is that here you have someone who is such an intellect and and and, and of, you know, of, of an unparalleled proportion. And yet he was able to relate to the everyday. You know, again, in the interview today with his sister-in-law, he said that she, he once came to their house in California to visit and her husband wasn't home and she was overwhelmed to a bunch of little children. And he said, well, we have to do something with these children. And he sat down and apparently he was a bit of an artist and he, he drew for each child their favorite animal their monkey, their giraffe, or whatever it was. And she said she was astounded. Here is this, this man came for a big lecture, comes to her house, and he sits down and he's drawing monkeys and giraffes, and he knew, how, he knew his zoology very well, and he drew this. And this is this paradox of this, you know, of, the, of this great person, this big intellect, yet, you know, never losing touch with not only the common man, but even the small child. So it's a, just a beautiful short story that I wanted to share as well. What, what do you think is the greatest, impact that he will have and uh, on you know and and had and in in the future in terms of his oh, writing his, his work is <laughs> absolutely timeless uh and that's all there is to it uh so uh R rashi is timeless rumbum is timeless and uh, rabbi steinsaltz is timeless and uh he will be recognized and studied forevermore really so uh great great privilege to know him and uh and by the way to experience in his office when i was discussing with him 
uh, things that were extremely important to me, he was doodling. So <laughs> <laughs> he had the ability to think about, think and do many things at the same time. Amazing talent. Truly extraordinary individual. We're going to share some of the footage that we have from his visit when he was in conversation uh, with, uh, with uh, Mr. Dolphin. And I want to thank you um, for sharing that and for sharing your personal encounters with him. You know, Maimonides says, and his laws of uh, getting uh, his laws on the Torah, he says that one should not only study Torah from a Talmud Chacham, but one should also observe the way he behaves, because in observing the way he behaves, we sometimes learn so much about the way we should behave and the, what we can endeavor, and certainly the challenges that he overcame and, and the way he overcame it. And the, the great, the great achievements that he had in his lifetime uh, is something that we can all, you know, be touched by. And to hear these little anecdotes, I think, frames the person in a way that can make it relatable for each and every one of us, and and inspire us in our in our lives. So I would like to just take this opportunity now to ask uh, my dear husband, Rabbi Yassi Shanowitz, to introduce the video that we're going to be seeing now that we're going to be showing, which is the video of him at Chabad of Westmount in this conversation where he spoke about uh, a couple of different things. And again, before we, before I introduce my husband, Rabbi Yassi, I just want to uh, remind you again that we're going to show a section of the video because Zoom is not the best technology to share videos apparently, but we will do is the following. After this session is over, we will make this video available both on our Facebook page and on our website. And if you would like to have a direct link, feel free to email me, Devorah at ChabadWestMount.com, and I will send you a direct link. It's an hour and a half of a wonderful, wonderful, humorous, sometimes conversation, deep, mystical, practical conversation. We're going to give you a taste of it today in tribute to Rabbi Steinzelt to honor his memory, but the sum of it really has to be seen through your own computer so that you can appreciate really the beauty and uh, the majesty of the simplicity of how he taught. So without further ado, Rabbi Yossi Shano is just to give a, a short introduction about Rabbi Steinzel, so his interactions and the video. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Tonight is special. We are honoring and paying tribute to a Torah sage who has done so much in his lifetime for Torah scholarship, spanning the gamut of Torah from the pshat, the straightforward, the literal, all the way through the esoteric, the Kabbalah. A man who single-handedly took on a mission of Rashi proportion, where he would translate the entire Talmud in modern Hebrew. And he saw that project through till the end. But that wasn't enough. Translated the Talmud into English, into French, into Spanish. This is, this is huge. This is unbelievable. Rabbi Yadin is leaving a legacy that will just keep on giving. A legacy that will only grow in time. Menachem, thank you for your beautiful words. And really it's, it's a blessing that you were in his inner circle. How many people were in his inner circle? And at Chabad, Chabad of Westmount, we feel blessed that on a certain level, we were two in his circle. He graced us three times with his presence. And every time he came, he gave a lecture, he did a fabrengen. Every time he left the people with a profound impact. Everyone who was in the room, and you had people from all walks of life who were impacted by his words. But they didn't have this talent, this unique ability to be able to take lofty concepts and to communicate them to people on every single level. His message resonated. And the reason that his message resonated is because when he spoke, 
he would get down to the essence of the matter, to the core of the issue. I want to share with you a memory at one of the Fabrengans that he had at our Chabad. We're having a Fabrengan and he was in the middle of a deep thought in the Torah. And mid-sentence, he paused and he turned to me and he says, you know something? Rabbis have to sing, have to speak less. They have to sing more. Do more singing, less talking. And I have to say that it is something that I took to heart. And, uh, and, and until this day, I follow, I follow his formula. But then he said, I would like you to sing one of my favorite songs. And the song is called the Shamil. And he went on to explain the whole song, the background of the song. It's a song that speaks to the struggle of the soul of the neshama. I was very moved Friday at his funeral and the family sang that song. They sang it and sang it again and again and again. That was the song that they were singing. A very powerful song speaks to the neshama. It's a song that was taught by the Lubavitch Rebbe in the 50s, in the late 50s, uh, at the night of Simcha's Torah. So Yehi Zichri Baruch, may his memory be a blessing to all of us. Right. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, stand by. I'm going to share the video that we have in, with him in Montreal. And, uh, and then we will conclude. So just bear with me for one second here as we share this. So we have uh, selected tonight is just to have a conversation. And uh, I'm going to ask some questions that were developed uh, between uh, Yossi and Devorah uh, of, of uh, Rabbi uh, Adin Evan Yisrael Steinsaltz. And um, uh, we'll let it take a free form. Uh, uh, Rabbi, you've just landed from Jerusalem. What is the mood in the country now? Now, the question is, do you want to hear propaganda or you want to hear truth? You have to decide. So, the truth is that most of the people are angry at the government because they wanted the government to enter the, the, the Gaza Strip and to to do some order there. Now, if, if it is possible, I'm not sure, because people have, are in the mood. And uh, I, I'm not sure that the people are right. But if you wanted to know what the mood is, I mean, look, in Israel, that's just to tell you something else. I mean, some of you possibly have been there, but it's not, it's not enough. At least I can, I can define myself, at least. I was born in Jerusalem. See? So that's, that's my country, and I know the country. Now, in the country, when you live in Jerusalem for such a time, uh, one of the things that you know is that every few years you have a war. So blood and bloodshed are a part, a part of your, your, your so what, what you think about, what you know about. So basically, basically, people don't, I mean, a few rockets here and there, really and truly, are not, are not making such of a difference. I remember being with my, again, I'm trying to be, to be not only friendly, but also see the honor of Rabbi Sanovitz, who is, he didn't tell him, they tell the, 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 the secret about the man, which he's ashamed of, he didn't want to tell it, so see. And uh, his brother is my, is my brother-in-law, you see. It's a good reason for coming here, not, not elsewhere in, 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 in Montreal. But anyway, I came with my wife once. We were in the, in the north of the country then. And then the, some of, the, of the, the neighbors on the other side of the border began to, 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 to use some guns and brothers and so on, some guns and cannons and so on. And, my wife was frightened. I mean, 
and I just rolled over in bed to the same <laughs> next side and, and kept sleeping. Why? Because it's a part of my, of my childhood, these guns roaring again and again and again. And, uh, and, and then you have a, 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 a peace time for a short while and then you again. So I'm saying you have to remember it. I mean, I know. First of all, one of the things, I don't know, possible, there is, there is a, a poor journalist here. But if there is or there isn't, you see, one of the, of the advices that I can give you gratis, not, not as a part of, of Chabad, is that do, you should not trust anything written in the newspaper. Basically, the basic notion should be that if it is written in the newspaper, it's possibly a lie. <laughs> and if it is not, then it's perhaps by mistake. So they, they, didn't, they, didn't, they didn't correct it good enough. But anyway, what I am just saying, of course, there is a, there is a war, but to, to speak about the mood, the people are more angry about that than about, about the, what they call the, the, about the, the rockets. Now the rockets, look, in some places the rockets are, are, were going on and on, or off and on for, for quite a time. Not that it, it's, not a, it's not a pleasant life. And when they had a, uh, just last Shabbos, uh, it was, they had a, an alarm in, in Jerusalem area. It didn't hit Jerusalem, but uh, okay, I heard these alarms as a boy, these alarms. And uh, I, I don't wish any of you to hear the voice of, of, a, of a bomb coming near. They have nasty voices. <laughs> before, even before they do the damage, they have a call. Possibly hear somebody, somebody here has some education. They, because of the Doppler effect, they have all kinds of strange, whiny noises that are not, but I'm saying, again, we could do it. The, the country is like, is angry. I still angry because we don't see an end to the, to the thing. And let me just say, I know that people here know everything about about Israeli politics, Canadian politics, American politics, the world in general. See, living in Israel in general, it's, it's a very complex country, very complex country. And we are living, see, I made it my suggestion that a place to put the Jewish state should be, there are two suggestions, one is a small, is a minor one, and to put it in Antarctica. That would be a good place with nice neighbors. The penguins are nice, quiet, and not, not damaging anybody. Now, perhaps it's too, now too close to the, to the influence of, yeah, of major powers, so the next place to, to put the Jewish state in safety is on the moon. Because in this era, in this, in this, in this globe of ours, Especially living in Israel, the land of Israel, is in it. such an unpleasant geopolitical situation that anything we do will, is, 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 is painful. And whatever we do is painful. So the point is that we, we can do in Israel as we do as we have to do in many other places, but even more so. Because we have to to sit, as they say, uh, just to, to sit Dvar Torah. Otherwise, they will, you'll, you'll think that I'm I'm, I'm uh, working for the for the Israeli council. So, but anyway, so they say that, but it was in the few parts of before. Umishma v'duma umasa. It's a three names of the children of Abraham. If you want to remember. The end of the Parsha. But anyway, Mishnah the Maramasa is. Uh, and the, the rabbis in the Talmud give the explanation according to the literal meaning of the words. It is to listen, to keep quiet, and to suffer. As a rule of life. To listen, Mishma, Veduma, which means keep quiet. Umasa and suffer and 
and suffer the bad. That's what we are doing, and we have to do all our, all our lives. And in all the harder possible, we can we can raise our voices and and feel more free. Here, this is our world, and we have to do in this world of ours, in this also in this country of ours. We just say, it's it's my flesh and blood and my my what I call my breath when I when I'm, I'm there, which is. So basically, I say it's not simple. It means it will it will contain always a lot of suffering, and I invite people to come and to share it. See, and to share it. I mean, you are possibly living. Okay, thank you. We are going to uh, we're going to conclude this part of the program right now. I'm just going to stop this share, and. Um, Bear with me for a second. Okay. We're going to conclude this part. Um, as you can see, the technology of Zoom, as, as wonderful as it is, um, does have some difficulties when it comes to sharing uh, a video and a video of that importance. So again, I just wanna remind everyone that anyone who signed up to this event tonight is going to receive a link a direct link to this, the entirety of this video, which is one and a half hours of an interview with Mr. Murray Dolphin and Rabbi Adin Steinsaltz. And then um, as well, we are going to be posting it on Facebook and on our website. I just want to conclude with the following thoughts. You know, Charlie Rose, um, in an interview that he did uh, with Adin Steinsaltz, he once asked him in this interview, he said, Rabbi, what is the meaning what is the meaning of life? And Rabbi Steinsaltz answered him as follows, and I will quote him. He said, once you ask, what is the meaning of life? Why it is done? For what purpose it is done? In that case, he said, you are already in the beginning of a process of having at least a possibility of a good life. And he continued and he said, if you don't even see this question, then whatever life you will have, it is simply an invitation of something. It's not real life. When we talk about, a, and that's the end of the quote, when we talk about a real life, I think Rabbi Steinsaltz shows us what it means to lead a real life. Defying all odds, he became one of the prolific teachers of Torah of this generation, but he never lost his personal touch and his humanity in the process. And I know that if he was watching this now, he would wonder about it because he never stood for pomp or circumstance. And I can say probably that he was even allergic to it. And I don't know, Murray, if you would concur with that. He never sought honor, but he did work tirelessly to bring more Judaism and Jewish knowledge to the world. So to truly honor him, I think he would want something more real, like he mentioned in this interview. And so I would call upon all of us tonight to do something real to honor his life. You're all here because in some way, you are intrigued by Rabbi Steinsaltz, you are touched by him, you've read his works. Let's do something to honor his life, more than just an evening attribute. Take upon yourself a mitzvah that you do in his honor to give some tzedakah, or perhaps buy another one of his books. We at Chabad of Westman will be beginning a new class on his teachings, and that will be our contribution to showing honor to his name. And I just wanna conclude with this. In one of the last interviews that he gave, in 2016, which he gave in Israel to an, an Israeli outlet, before he had a stroke that left him unable to speak, he said the following, and I quote, he said, I never thought about what will be written on my tombstone. It doesn't really preoccupy me, but I am concerned but by what will be remembered. I did something, but I didn't do enough. I didn't even do a fraction of the things that I wanted to do. I wrote such and such books, very nice. I gave such and such lectures, very nice. I wrote articles like sand on the seashore. It's not enough. What would I have, I wanted to do? I would have wanted to leave behind a small tree that will grow. Rabbi Steinsaltz planted those trees valiantly throughout his life diligently and with great sacrifice. And now it's our turn to water and nourish those trees through the study of his works and his teaching. 
And in this way, his life continues. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. And I want to thank especially um, Mr. Murray Menachem Dolphin for sharing with us his relationship and for the people who I interviewed today, uh, his sister-in-law and others who helped shape some of the narratives that we were able to glean about his life. And may his life be something that inspires us and inspires future generations to come. And we will keep studying his works. And for those of you who follow our programs, watch out. There will be courses on his teachings this fall. Thank you for joining us. Have a good night. And to share your mitzvah, if you want to share your mitzvah that we can pass on to his family as a source of comfort, please email your mitzvah to info at ChabadWestMount.com and we will pass it over to the Steinzeltz family in Jerusalem. May his memory be a blessing and may his works bring light and beauty to the Jewish people for generations to come. Thank you very, very much for joining. Have a good evening. Amen. Good night.